Hello and welcome to the Anita Po Show, where I'm here to help you understand Bitcoin, realize its humanitarian implications for the world and gain financial sovereignty. I'm your host, Anita Posch, and this is episode 177 of my show, and my guest today is Karel von Weick. He's here a second time. The first episode was number 155. Karel found out about Bitcoin as early as in 2010, and being a technically skilled entrepreneur, he realized Bitcoin's potential to change the world very early. Karel was a co-founder at Luno, one of the biggest exchanges globally, and he is the mastermind behind Pick and Pay's acceptment of Bitcoin payments with the development of the CryptoQR app, which is an app that is translating the unified QR payment codes from Pick and Pay to Lightning invoices. So if you want to go to Pick and Pay in South Africa and pay with Lightning, you need to ask at the till for scan to pay. I met Karel at Adopting Bitcoin in Cape Town in January 2024. It was the first Bitcoin-only conference in South Africa. And since then, I've paid all my daily goods in Cape Town, in, <laughs> in Cape Town at Pick and Pay <laughs> with Bitcoin. You can do the same and you can watch me doing it in the course of the YouTube version of this interview. Sounds interesting? Please subscribe to my free newsletter to receive more content like this at anita.link slash weekly. And now enjoy the episode. Hello, Karen. Hi there. Nice to meet you again. After, Thank you, Anita. Was it 2022, I think? It feels had... like yesterday. <laughs> it does. Yes. Really, for me, it feels like it has been a long time. <laughs> um, so we're here because uh, first Bitcoin-only conference in Cape Town. Exciting. Yes, extremely exciting. I mean, I, I've been trying to organize Bitcoin meetups and, and groups for a very long time. This is the first time that we have a proper Bitcoin conference. It's not blockchain and crypto and all that nonsense. It's yeah, extremely exciting. I think it's the, the first route that we're setting down and can hopefully grow into a much larger tree. I hope so too. And a lot of your work is focused also on Bitcoin adoption. Absolutely. And yes. um, you recently, last year, launched a app with which everyone can now pay at the largest supermarket chain in South Africa with Bitcoin, with Lightning. That's right. So maybe a small correction. We do call it the Walmart of South Africa, but it's the second largest chain in Africa. So, oh, wow. Um, ShopRite being the, uh, the first in South Africa, in South Africa as well, it's the second largest. But that doesn't mean it's small. They have a, no. more than 1,500 outlets to sell all kinds of things, clothing and, and you know, value-added services. Mm -hmm. And they also have branches in Zimbabwe, where I was That's right. recently. That's right. Unfortunately, and that tech isn't available there now, but maybe in the future we can... Do you think they will open it up also in Zimbabwe? That would be huge for me, personally. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it depends. I think we can, we can talk about what's needed for the tech, but it's not that straightforward. We need, obviously, we need like, good liquidity and um, regulations need to be favorable and all of that stuff. So yeah. hopefully in the future. But South Africa is the perfect place for it at the moment. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, Lightning is still, I mean, you can use it as money. Yeah. Do you think there's uh, the chance that uh, they will KYC Lightning? Lightning wallets. Lightning wallets, yeah. Custodial, um, definitely, I guess. I'm sure there will be significant government pressure over time. I mean, we're seeing all the stuff from the US and Elizabeth Warren and even from the EU talking about uh, what they call um, unhosted wallets. I hate, yeah. that, I hate that term self-custody wallets um, and we can see government pushing back on those things but uh, at the end of the day it's actually extremely difficult to regulate because it's possible to uh, do it in a much more decentralized way so we can talk about scaling and centralization forces but because it's possible to do it in a more decentralized way it's very more, much more difficult to uh, censor and, and impose controls 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily apply to, to the merchant side of the equation. Because the, um, the merchant is not holding funds. Mm -hmm. So uh, the wallet issue is, is something completely different from acceptance of payments. That's right, yeah. So you say, yeah, maybe explain a little bit how did it come to the point where you offered them that solution? Mm -hmm. How does the solution work? So that's a fantastic thing about Pick and Pay. They approached me. I didn't go into their corporate offices and then try to orange pill people. Uh, which, which most people assume is what happened. But the, the truth is actually that if you look at the way that people pay at Pick and Pay, I mean, um, in terms of value, most people probably use credit cards. So in terms of the random amount. But if we look at how many transactions occur in cash, it's the majority. Mm -hmm. So that means still the majority of people are paying in cash. Mm -hmm. And for large retailers, cash is a massive problem. We're seeing an increase in cash in transit crime in South Africa, mm -hmm. it's huge risk and um, a burden to the retailer. So they've taken a stance and said we want to, we want to engage industry players and help develop digital payment solutions. So for them, adding Bitcoin was this stake in the ground to say, look, we're taking a stand, we're, we're going to be adopting new technologies and what uh, more sort of forward thinking future technology is there than accepting Bitcoin payments. Now they've done that. Um, and they can use that to drive the strategy even further. That's fantastic. Um, tell us, how does it work in uh, real life? I think I right. need your app. Yes, that's right. So it's, many people scan the pick and pay code. There's a QR code that pops up on the, on the display. You have to ask for QR checkout because obviously you have to pick cash, card or QR code. Mm -hmm. If you pick the QR code option, that code is displayed and then a lot of people scan it with a lightning wallet and it doesn't work. And they're confused. Why is that? Mm -hmm. So maybe just some background and context. There's a lot of mobile payment wallet apps in South Africa these days. And what's happened is we ended up with many QR codes. And that's a problem as well, wow. right? Now adding another one for Lightning, then adding another one for Liquid, I don't know what, mm -hmm. that becomes a big problem. So the, the industry has actually said, no, we, instead what we'll do is we'll consolidate to sort of a universal QR standard. It's not a lightning standard, it's, it's just a reference to that transaction. So what needs to happen is there needs to be a translation from that QR code into a lightning invoice if you want to pay it with lightning. And that's all we've done. We've built a companion app, it's just a QR code scanner. It scans this universal South African QR payment code, retrieves the payment information, generates a lightning invoice, and then you can pay the lightning invoice. But we've, we've tried to make it as seamless as possible. I know it's annoying having another app, but, but what the app does is you, it launches your preferred wallet. Yeah. So it'll be very stream, streamlined. If you're the first time that you've set it up, after that you never think about it again. It's, not, it's actually not that awkward. You just, know, yeah, you just need to know and you will get used to it. If yes. you get to pay at Pick and Pay very often with that version, like with Lightning, yeah. and you know, okay, I just take my crypto. Uh, exactly. How's it called? Crypto Qua? Crypto convert. crypto convert. I get a lot of flack for the name. We can talk about that if you want, but because it's called crypto, crypto convert. No, we don't yes. need to talk about it because okay. I know your stance on that. But we are, um, let me just say this: uh, we are a Bitcoin Lightning first. Your, your company is called crypto convert. The company is crypto convert. The, okay, so the application, the companion application, is called Crypto QR. QR, exactly. Crypto and it's QR. available for Android and iOS. iOS and Android. Okay, it's just cool. a QR code scanner. Yeah, yeah. It launches your wallet. But the QR code scanner is the translator, or where it's, is? Yeah, it's a translation. Okay, exactly. Yes. Because then uh, it opens up the Lightning wallet, and you can also select which standard wallet you want to choose, or another wallet. Yes. So what we try to do is we try to detect the Lightning wallets on your device, mm -hmm. and then you can pre-select which one will be the default yeah. that, that opens up. Um, you can also copy-paste the invoice, but that's a little bit... That's a bit slower. Oh, you could also do that, yeah. yeah. So, um, how's the adoption of it? I mean, how many people are using it? Do you know that? I'm, I'm surprised by the adoption. I think when we first roll this out, there's so many open questions. First open question is, firstly, will people spend yeah. Bitcoin? Yeah. Will they have Lightning wallets that's funded? And then thirdly, will they go through the effort of installing this scanner application, this companion application, another app? So there's quite a number of, uh, if you look at it like as a funnel, one number of points that it drop off. And what we've seen is extremely encouraging to me is that people actually put in the effort, they make the effort to 
go through the, this process of finding a Lightning Wallet, installing the companion app, linking it, going to the toll, asking for a QR code and paying. So we've, we're seeing mm. for the past five months, we've seen 30% growth month to month. Oh, cool. And what I'm hoping is, so we launched this nationally in February in 2023, so it's about a year ago. I'm hoping that we can see a, a 4x in our numbers by Feb this year. In other words, 300% increase. I can imagine this weekend with the Adopting Bitcoin conference I'm hoping here. so. I'm hoping so. <laughs> I'm sure. Look, I hope. We'll, yeah. We'll send them all. <laughs> I'm definitely encouraging everybody to try it because it feels like magic. And like some people that visit um, and, and I go with them to the Pick and Pay, we go through it. They say it almost feels like they just did a heist, like a bank heist. They just paid with like this illegal money and walked out with... <laughs> Good, but it's completely legitimate, yeah. completely functional, and um, yeah, it's it, it, it it's quite a nice feeling being able to buy your pizza or your whatever with Bitcoin. Um, question: Do you, as a company, get a transaction fee from Pick and Pay for yeah. the service? So that's yeah. Pick and Pay, obviously, being a large retailer, had quite a lot of bargaining power, and we we didn't have a lot of wiggle room on the transaction fee. We don't take a lot on that. Yeah. Um, what we have instead is a service fee. Yeah, okay. We've but got a standard, like a, a fixed business, service I mean, fee, typically. Yes, we do. Okay. And unfortunately, the, the the reality is that this is a volumes game. Payments, payments is a volumes game. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, the volumes are quite small, and we're basically still self-funding and bootstrapping the company. It's not self self-sustainable. But if growth continues um, the way it does now, we, we will eventually get there not too long into the future. Uh, how easy would it be to do this for other merchants as well? Yeah, so it would actually be easy in the, in the technical sense. The technical integration is not the, is not the bottleneck. Ironically, the compliance is actually a bit more strict. There's always a customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And because the volumes are still low, it's difficult to cover that initial cost. But yeah. as again, as it scales, as there's more adoption, and there's more volumes, then it, it's easier to onboard smaller and smaller and smaller merchants. But for now, we're focusing on the largest aggregators and retailers. And, mm -hmm. But we do have a pizza, we do have a pizza shop, Butler's Pizza. You can order and get your pizza delivered and order uh -huh. and pay with yeah. sets. So I will definitely do all of that, of okay. course. So I already have got your app on my phone right. and we'll go to pick and pay afterwards. All right. And I will also, of course, buy a pizza with uh, Bitcoin because a lot of people say it's silly to spend your Bitcoin, yeah. which of course, yeah, uh, you can say so if you see the trend going up over the last 15 mm -hmm. years. Um, but I'm uh, basically living off the donations and all the. You're earning uh, the it. That's your. That, that is your in income. And then, you, then you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's my it, income, course. and I have to spend yes. it. I need either to exchange it because otherwise I can't get anything without fiat currency. Yeah. I much rather spend it directly instead of the the hassle to exchange exactly. it and then also maybe get problems with my bank account because they say where does this money come from. So I, I will, at the conference I'm, I'm speaking, I will cover the, exactly this concept because the traditional sort of view in Bitcoin land is, you know, hodl. Exactly. To the moon. <laughs> Stay humble, stack sets. Mm -hmm. That is, that's good. Mm -hmm. But you still, when you say those things, you still have a fiat mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Let me explain that. So you, you do some job, you're probably earning fiat, most likely, statistically then you're buying some Bitcoin and stashing it, stacking it. And I'm not saying you need to spend the Bitcoin that's in your stack. What I am saying is you need to buy more Bitcoin. And instead of spending your dirty fiat, make the effort to rather spend Bitcoin, um, not from your stack. So I'm not saying you don't spend from your stack. I'm just saying buy more Bitcoin replenish and spend it. and replenish it. So spend and stack. And the, the reason that's important is because the more people do this, the more people go through the effort of converting fiat into Bitcoin to spend, the more merchants will accept it. And then suddenly you start building momentum in the circular economy. So that is the only way that will grow the circular economy is if people spend it. And I'm not saying don't huddle. No. I'm saying buy more Bitcoin, huddle the, your savings, but try to spend it as well. Both are part of adoption. Yes. Yes. So, of course, hodling and uh, having Bitcoin as a store of value is an adoption driver because yes. people see, oh, this guy has saved so much now uh, and can afford this and that. And on yeah, the other hand, but that's more, that, that you get only the merchants on and grow to when you spend it. 
the number go up aspect. That's why I'm saying it's fiat mentality because exactly. you're still thinking kind of in dollar it's terms and, and rand terms because your expenses are still, you're still thinking in terms of rand and, and also, dollars. Also, um, just by that, we won't change the core mentality in the financial sector on a, or our money, yeah. you know, with like... I don't want to say the financial sector, I want to say in the, just in, on the market. Yeah. In the market. market. Yeah. And I think the... Um, that's the, the point is that ultimately we want to get to a point where it's possible to earn Bitcoin, right? Exactly. Then, then you've completely offboarded yourself from fiat. And the only way we can do that is if there's, there's a greater, a bigger Bitcoin based economy. Yeah, and I want to live in a world where I can exchange Bitcoin with you on a basis in between us. So if you, I buy a good from you exactly. as a business, we, we can do that. Difficult, but we yeah. can do that. Yes. So without all this, non, without the KYC stuff, because right. I want also privacy. Yeah. I want the options I have with cash. Mm. But with Bitcoin, it's much better because I can send it anywhere. It doesn't rot uh, and I don't have national inflation on it. Yeah, the, K, the KYC issue is going to become more and more pressing. Because what we're seeing increasingly is leaked databases, leaked stores of Absolutely. data, even from government entities. Mm -hmm. And people are realizing that, that KYC actually makes you a target in the long run. Because that database, it can sit around for a very long time, your details are leaked, and then criminal elements have access to not only your personal information, but also your personal financial uh, records. Exactly. And this is, these are big problems that will become sort of more uh, mainstream discussions in the near future, I'm sure of that. And just think about AI, what AI is going yes. to do with yeah, deep of fakes all, of yeah. your video, like uh, as a video, you on video in a deep exactly. fake, you can do KYC identification with that. And it's yeah. actually not you. And exactly. then they will steal and whatever, uh, banks and regulatory authorities will have problems I, with I have that. a friend, um, he's also in the space, also called Carl. His statement has always been, things need to get worse first. We, things just yep. need to get break yeah. before it'll get fixed. Yeah. The point is people need to feel pain before we, we take action. Yeah. So sadly, I think things will be getting worse and before they get better. I think so too, yeah. But speaking about things getting better, how do you think, uh, especially when we have seen the rise of transaction fees on Bitcoin on-chain, I mean, I'm an absolute proponent of self-custody. Mm -hmm. But um, with the rising fees, it might be, on the one hand, difficult for many people who might not have the wealth to afford these yeah. fees. And on the second hand, um, we have the problem with um, scaling Bitcoin on chain. I mean, it's technically not possible that everyone in the world can use Bitcoin on chain. Um, what is your view on scaling Bitcoin in the future? So, like. Self-custody maybe is just an ideal, you know, mm. a, a, a philosophical ideal. Not yes. everyone, we, you and me, we will be able to have hopefully. on-chain Bitcoin, I'm hoping so. hopefully, yeah, because we were earlier than most other people. But other than that, what's your thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts and I've seen you express your thoughts uh, online as well and I have some heated discussions about it. Um, I think stay humble and stack sad. So let's, let's, let's all just stay humble for a bit and not assume that all the problems are solved. The scaling problem has been there from day zero. It's always been there and it hasn't been solved. We don't have um, a, an obvious solution for it today. The question then is, should we be pessimistic about it and, and you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater or should we continue and develop solutions for the problems that we face as they arise. I'm definitely in the second camp. I feel that uh, you know s solutions exist, and it might be that we there's trade-offs. It might be that we look at how we store and spend our Bitcoin is different. So maybe our spending wallets will have lower degrees of trust and self-sovereignty and self-custody, while our savings have more. Um, the idea or, or the problem of, of increasing chain fees that was always going to be a problem. Yeah. If, if you assume that Bitcoin is something that people need to adopt, the chain fees will always be a problem. And like we've seen in the past, people have said, well, let's increase the block size, then the fees will go down. In, in terms of sort of the path ahead, I think it's, it's more clear for us what we should not do. 
rather than what we should do. The should is we should be experimenting. We should be using the technologies and um, new systems that's being developed, new ways of thinking. So I'm, I'm talking now about things like Fedi, Liquid, yes. Um, federated custody, basically. Mm -hmm. Self-custody is the, the ideal, but an interim step might be federated custody. And then, of course, there will be extremely strong centralizing forces and pressures driving activity to centralized service providers. You know what, maybe not so bad, again, if, you're, if it's your daily spending wallet. But I fully agree with you that the, 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 the whole point of Bitcoin is that it's money that's free. My wife said, what does it mean? Can I just get it for free? No, and it's I said, not free. It's, it's not free, free as in pizza or beer. It's free yeah. as in... For anyone to use? Speech. Free you know, speech. Exactly. Free as in speech. Uncensored. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what we should strive for. So, so it's up for debate. It's not a solved problem. Yeah, it's not a clear-cut thing. So not everyone will be able to have on-chain keys. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is it possible for you to stay uncensored mm -hmm. with your funds? And can you always redeem it or use it as you wish? Yes. And then maybe, you know, it is in a federated custody or a shared custody or maybe even in a Bitcoin bank. We will yeah. see them, yeah? Um, but not in an ETF, right? What you, what, what's your opinion on ETFs? Uh, well, I, I don't have much of an opinion, really. It's, I, I, I'm surprised it took this long. I expected it to be, uh, to be around much earlier, but I don't really have much of an opinion on it. I, don't, I, don't, I think maybe um, the, there's this sort of discussion around Bitcoin as a store of value, and the ETFs have a lot of impact on the store of value part of the discussion. I actually spend relatively little time thinking about that use case and think a lot more in terms of the medium of exchange and money aspect because we're in South Africa and for us we live under a sort of monetary regime that's far more restricted and um, declining so, so we kind of think about the money aspect a lot more. I spend my time thinking, so ETF, I don't know if it has much of a short or even medium term impact on that. Um, what would you say as a South African, I mean the voices coming from the African continent are still much smaller than those yes. from the US or Europe or anywhere else. Um, why is that? Because it's such a huge continent and the utility of Bitcoin is so big here. So the need is so big, but still the adoption is less than on all the other continents. Um, why do you think that is? And what can people who live here do um, to have more voice? Mm -hmm. So. I think firstly just the Africa, even though it's a large continent with many, many people living there, the, the level of connectedness is actually fairly low, especially connectedness to the rest of the world. Maybe in part because we are isolated. We've got all these sort of controls and rules um, that, that limits our, our exposure or, or ability to interact with international um, yeah. peers. Whereas the US and the EU, there's very high levels of adoption of, you know, internet adoption and then things like social media and there's a lot more people with the necessary funding and tools to do podcasts and things like that. So I think it's, it's, it's just that there's, it's a more level, higher level of connectedness, um, but that's changing and it's changing fast. So in terms of what people should be doing, I don't want to prescribe, but I think you consider your position, your station in life and what what what's the cards available to you to play play those cards to the best of your ability and try to try to reach out yeah, great. Now, the interesting thing because i put that in my keynote for tomorrow is i think that south africa is actually very pioneering on we uh, are. in the bitcoin space you have things that none other countries have like the pick and pay payment possibility um, one can buy electricity with lightning on in your tool uh, then we have Bitcoin Ikasi, we have Bitcoin Witsend. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there? Craig Raw lives here, the guy yeah. who built... We, yeah, we've got some the prominent... Yeah, that's the, 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 the Sparrow in the space. app. Yes. It's one of the best Bitcoin desktop apps. And privacy apps. oriented, yes. Apps, yes, and very private. And like um, he's uh, doing a lot of education in that terms as well. Then there's KG with Machankura A3 for yeah. free. Yeah. So, so many uh, solutions and innovation 
that you don't see in the US. But, maybe, yeah, yeah. but I think a lot of these things that you just mentioned, uh, it, it's, it sort of centers around, again, the money or the medium of exchange use aspect, yeah, exactly. aspect, which is where we feel the need because that's where we, we feel the pain. And that pain isn't felt in the US. That pain isn't felt in the EU. But we are sitting here, we've been experiencing that pain for a long, long time. It's not only recently, we've been experiencing it for decades. And now this technology becomes available to us. And it lets us engage with it, not only as consumers, but as builders as well. What are the problems? Like the run devaluation, I assume? Uh, we can talk about, yeah, there, there's yeah. so many. So maybe, maybe just sort of uh, off the bat, if you term, think in terms of restrictions on our money, moving money across the border is a highly permission thing and it's, it, there's thresholds, there's limits. So for example, if I wanted to send money to you in Zem or wherever, I would need to fill in some special forms, there would need to be some reporting on that. The exact reason that I'm doing this, um, and, mm -hmm. and again, it's limited. That limit has been in place, the current limit's been in place since uh, about 10 years ago, 2011. And over time, that limit erodes. So our thresholds, mm -hmm. even though the threshold itself stays the same, the actual value of it is constantly diminishing. So our, our, our restrictions are increasing over time. That's the one thing. Yeah. And then secondly, the currency itself, due to, due to a declining economy, the buying power versus international um, currencies like the US and the dollar and the, and the euro, it, it, it loses its buying power. The exchange rate is declining. And in fact, what we even see is governments artificially devaluing currencies. In Malawi in November, we've seen a 44% devaluing of the currency by the government. And they can just do that ad hoc. So I think in terms of just the, the, the restrictions placed on our money, it's, the, there's far more issues that we deal with than, than the US that you deal with. Yeah, I think it's a, also a lot of these issues people can't even understand yeah. if you don't live here. You can't understand it. I think maybe one thing, I don't know how much time, one, one more thing to, to mention. Like I said, 90% of people pay with cash in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just because the, the restrictions and burdens around getting a credit card machine for a shop to get a credit card machine in the hands is so high that it's practically impossible for the shopkeeper to afford either the money or the time to get a credit card machine. And then even if they have it, nine out of 10 customers walking to the shop still will be paying with cash. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if we can reduce those frictions, we've got these high levels of friction on our money, and payment systems, if we can reduce these levels of frictions, then can we transition into space where there's fewer reliance, uh, people relying on cash and less cash in transit highs and all that? I think that's what most people totally underestimate, how also spending Bitcoin free gives you freedom. Yes. Freedom from all this bureaucracy and regulations and, and KYC also. Yeah. And um, it, how it increases your privacy. Um, and so I think also like, let's end this maybe now because we need to go to pick and pay to right. buy okay. some stuff with Lightning. Um, but that's what people underestimate. And I, for my feeling, spending Bitcoin and holding and saving Bitcoin is both at the same time important for you as a person mm. or as an individual or to care for your family or whatever. Um, and thank you very much, Karel. Um, Thanks, Anita. For meeting me again. Thanks for your time. And no, of course, anytime. Let's go to pick and pay. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. That's it. Thanks for joining. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to my newsletter at anita.link slash weekly to get all my updates into your mailbox directly and please recommend it to your friends. Music Late Truth by Audio Hertz. Until next time at the Anita Post Show.